but he's, uh, he's now working at the UK HSA and um, he has a joint position with the MSC Biostatistics Unit in Cambridge and, and the only thing I can say is a statistician and is part of the SPIM. Um, his work, or I should say our work, uh, has been contributing to, has contributed to the, to the consensus of, of SPIM for Two years now. We finished the we last yesterday was the last uh, the last meeting of SPIM. So we've been at it for yeah two years. Paul, I leave it to you to do justice to our work. Uh, well, thanks, Danny. I'll I'll try and do justice to to our work. Um, you've actually given half my talk already, so hopefully there's plenty <laughs> there. <laughs> well, I had, I had, I had spare time. <laughs> Okay, so as, as Danny said, I'm going to talk about our, our efforts to do real-time monitoring of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Um, it's obviously it's been a rather hectic period, and we, you know, it's not one where you can sort of sit back and, and and look at all the details of the model and make sure that you're, you know, doing proper, thorough, robust model criticism. And, and, and uh, so it's been constantly developing it on the hoof and, and and patching it up and sending it back into battle throughout. Um, so just an overview of the of, of the pandemic, um, uh, and, and just you know I, I don't need to talk to this that this the sheer scale of, of, of the pandemic. Um, we've plotted here or we've taken plots of the admissions over time and the deaths over time, which are two indicators which we uh, fit our model to. Um, obviously, they're they're imperfect and, and lagged, um, imperfect in that they. You know, there will be an element of people who are admitted to hospital or, or die who are admitted with COVID, not because of COVID. Um, but uh, and we've chosen these two data streams though, rather than cases, particularly because the changing ascertainment over the course of the pandemic leads, for example, the cases have a very small first wave, but we know the peak of the first wave is very high. Um, so these are two data streams that we'll be looking at, and we're trying to fit our model to along along with others. Um, and this is, I'll put this slide, it should go at the end of the talk, but it's at the front because, um, because we're quite proud of it. Um, and this is, these are snapshots of, current in, of the current infectious status in England. So what do we think the current pattern susceptibility looks like? So this is susceptibility um, uh, by region in this plot. Um, so you can see that it's particularly low in London where you might, have had, you might reasonably expect to have higher attack rates. Uh, and high in the southwest. This is amongst people who've been on the left-hand column that's never infected with people who've had a previous infection. Um, and it's stratified by vaccine dose. So you, have, you ha add up the height of all these bars to get the fraction of the population who our model predicts are currently susceptible, admittedly with reduced susceptibility in, in the, in the um, three plus vaccine states, um, but somehow susceptible to infection. And we can also put this into a map so we, we see how this fits by region and by age group. Um, and that, that's just to show the age profile again here on the left here. So um, just a quick outline of the talk, um, quick talk about um, why we do what we're doing um, and, and a little talk about our, the head start that we had through, through some pandemic preparedness work. Um, stages of the modelling of, of, of COVID, so that you know what we did for the first wave and how we've had to develop the model over time, and some results from epidemic reconstruction. Um, I'd like to talk about the re reproduction number, which has been was early on in the in the, in the um, uh, and it was a key key headline figure that was often quoted. Uh, and there's some some query was raised in the, in the briefing of speakers is to look at why ours remained close to one for quite so long. Um, Little discussion of computational challenges, which shouldn't be nested under here, but um, I've labelled it as a subsection on this section, and how we've used the model. So um, we had a head start in that we tried to apply a, sim a similar model to a previous pandemic in 2009. Danny said that we worked together for 14 years, and this was my introduction to working on um, uh, well pandemics and, and, and flu pandemics. Um, and we parachute into working onto the, on, into a real-time modeling project halfway through the pandemic and never quite got up to speed until right at the very end. Um, but we carried on working on, on the, uh, the model that we developed that was the official PHE um, real-time model, um, publishing papers. This, this one was from 2011, this was 2016, looking at how 
spatial patterns of infection, or how best to model spatial patterns of infection in a, in a parsimonious way. Um, but we also, there was an NIHR grant which we got, which allowed us to develop a, a, a sort of software, which was um, a flexible pandemic flu modeling framework. So it's, it's, it's 10,000 lines of code to do something that could probably be done with bespoke code in about 100 lines. But, um, but because we want to be able to capture for a whole wide range of possible models or modeling scenarios, it, it's much more complicated. Um, this was a mothballed project, so it allowed us to develop the code and, and store it away for a while. Um, and the MRC carried on supporting it after 2015. Um, so an SIR type transmission model with um, complex disease reporting components, which we've trialed on seasonal influenza, particularly the 2017-18 season since. Um, and so when in February 2020, we're looking at rolling out real-time modeling, we had some flexible software which we could minimally adapt and swiftly deploy um, to, to keep track of the pandemic. Um, the aims of real-time modeling is to provide now casting so estimates of the current state of the pandemic. So this has included levels of, levels of disease transmission, um, summarized by the R number or the, or the growth rate. Uh, numbers of new daily infections and prevalence, uh, and estimates of the population ever infected attack rate. Uh, forecasting what will happen over the short term or medium term future. Um, deterministic epidemic models are not good for doing long term forecasting, and, and uh, with various interventions, the pandemic is very difficult to do anyway. Um, and we have to be able to do it in real time. So currently, we we fit the model on on. Uh, Date on Friday, we fit it over a weekend and present results on, on Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, ideally, we'd be able to do it much quicker, but um, limited data provision and, and the, the computational burn of the model limit us to that routine. And, and we've had a number of stakeholders, most notably within UK HSA, uh, across the NHS, and SPI N. Uh, so, initially, we tried doing some modeling. I think. I put here the 20th of March, I think the first time around the world might have been the 16th of March. Um, we had sufficient data to estimate a number of parameters and we could partition the, the, the epidemic into two regions, London and outside of London. Um, and we looked at what epidemics would be reasonable to expect under a lockdown. And we looked at two, three different scenarios for overall reduction in transmission, 24, 48, and 64% reduction. And looking at these three scenarios, we could see that there's potential for something pretty horrible to occur with, with peaks fairly soon. So late April, we're getting here or with, with only a minimal reduction or uh, with a 64% reduction is a long, low, flat peak, but still peaking at 100,000 infections a day, which is, we now know is nothing, but with a potential for a very high. Um, so we, we figured that to keep, to be, to keep R to one, and to be fairly certain that we're doing it with 95% probability, we required a 73% reduction in contacts. Uh, similarly, for outside London, slightly higher, we required a 74% reduction in, in contacts, um, which might be quite surprising, but we, we seem to think that London had been had a larger seeding of infection, not necessarily that the growth rate was higher. Um, so over time, as the epidemic has gone on, um, this was the sort of simple model that we had to begin with. The grey area currently houses one susceptible state, stratified by region and, and age group. The light blue se segments give the, the things that we observe. So we, are, we, were, we were calibrating the model to time series of deaths. Uh, and also, uh, when it became available, we started using um, data on serological sampling conducted by the NHS Blood and Transplant Service, which informs us the, the size of the the size of the susceptible population. Um, so that no, just linking to what I've just said. Um, but we also imported information on contact rates through Edwin van Leeuwen's work uh, using Polymod, uh, Google Mobility, ONS Time Use Survey, and, and uh, EFE school attendance to put into a melting pot and come out with time varying weekly contact matrices, which allowed us. Um, particularly to sort of um, cover the gap, to now cast the, the gap between um, the time which our data are informative about. So it takes three weeks to develop a positive 
an average a positive antibody response and deaths of three weeks or more after infection. Plus they're subject to reporting delay. So we didn't really know anything about infection that was happening in the previous three weeks. So the use of these contact rates allowed us to project forward using data that was relatively up to the moment. Uh, and we had lots of prior information on various parameters, for example, the age-specific IFR. Um, and we've been producing these public, published reports on the uh, MRC Biostatistics Unit website regularly. Um, this is one of, our, I think, our second attempt at publishing um, all the various epidemic uh, nowcast points of interest. Uh, and we made the mistake of publishing a central estimate for the Northwest for an R value of 1.01 .01 with a credible interval, you know, bracketing one, um, which led to um, uh, calls for lockdown of study finds R value above one, 1.01, uh, which led to the delaying of schools opening in the Northwest or in, around Manchester. Um, so it was it, we, it was an eye-opening uh, exposure to how, how, how our results could be very easily over-interpreted. Uh, these are some uh, uh, results we published in the um, More Society uh, CSB paper, uh, looking at how the infections varied over time, the impact of the lockdowns, a very abrupt stop to, to the infections there, um, and then a sort of slight resurgence as we adjust to the, the new eigenvalue or the new, new pattern of transmission after lockdown. Um, and then we can map R over time. This is an evolution of a random walk and a and the contact matrices, which I'll discuss later, and showing some bits of the death data, which is pretty good. And this is for two of the regions, London and Northwest, but we, we, we model for nine regions in total. Um, so this is kind of a timeline of the pandemic, lots of um, sort of categorizing the events that have happened, red, the emergence of different variants, green, the lifting of restrictions, blue, the imposition of restrictions, and, and, and yellow, the various vaccination campaigns. Uh, and this has presented lots of modelling challenges. Uh, first, data can be lagged or informative, um, discussed the lags, but also we were reliant on death data for a long time. And around July 2020, and again in May 2021, there was only a handful of deaths per day, and less, you know, in some regions less than one. So that's not particularly informative when you're trying to estimate several hundred parameters. Um, the emergence of variants with varying severity and transmissibility, the impact of vaccination campaigns, waning immunity can add complexity to models you'll see, uh, and, and immune escape, uh, particularly due to, due to Omicron. Um, and this all adds increased model complexity and an associated com computational burden. So first things first, we want to get rid of lag in data. So we, we use the ONS uh, COVID infection survey to get estimates of prevalence. So, uh, and also, um, over some of fewer, fewer deaths were occurring, so I had to incorporate a time varying IFR. Um, and we had to add models to states to the model. So we've added a, an R plus state. This is a state uh, in which you're assumed to be PCR positive. So you would test positive, but you're no longer infectious. And this blue shaded area now says that the ONS data that we were getting, or ONS estimates that we were deriving from the, from the ONS, we're now being related to model quantities and we used as part of our model fitting. This gave us improved timeliness and, and eased the burden on the contact matrices in terms of now casting what we think is actually happening at the, at the current moment. Um, so the vaccination campaigns in, involved greater complexity. Uh, we had to stratify susceptibles by vaccination status, um, which used data on vaccination uptake and estimates of vaccine efficacy. So we, we were able to do it just by stratifying the susceptible states and assuming a leaky vaccine protection, which would give the impression of also some waning as well. Um, and we used uh, vaccine efficacy estimates for uh, protection against infection, but also, whereas once before this box at the bottom had new infections, we now have effective new infections, which sort of discounts the number of new infections according to what we think the vaccine efficacy against severe diseases as well. Um, further complexity was added when, when Omicron emerged and we had to have waning immunity. Um, we, we had to go the whole hog and stratify everything else by vaccination status. We introduced uh, two, uh, two waning states here. So this is 
waning but not yet susceptible to has waned and now susceptible having previously been infected and, we, and, the and moving vertically you go down the number of vaccine doses given um, and, and this, this intermediate stage is in, introduced to give some kind of memory some kind of sense that those who've been longer ago infected were becoming um, were becoming susceptible earlier rather than it being an exponential decay and then finally is the booster vaccination campaign which we had to add an extra row to this so as we had a nice simple model to begin with we've now got much greater complexity and these these plates indicate that we do this we fit this model in each each of um, our regions so we do it for a number of different geographies uh, for the nhs regional split or for an ons regional split so this is typically seven or nine regions um, and and more recently in the last couple of months we moved to alongside modeling this but also having a separate model for hospital admission it's a it's a probably of greater interest for nhs planning and um, moving into the future we in a, in a, a data landscape that's going to be diminished from what it is now um hospital admissions that people will still be tested on admission to hospital and so we think this is going to be a, a, a data set will, will will remain reliable for, for a bit longer. So these are the typical results. We get these are sort of now casting to, to last week, uh, getting our estimates of you know 1.3, 1.4. Um, but also we estimate the number of new infections. So this is 50 million cumulative infections in total. This includes um, reinfections and a rather scary. 416,000 infections per day in the country, which is probably more than any other time during the, the pandemic. Um, infection uh, attack rates we have for each region. Um, London and Northeast being the highest, and overall in England, it's 67%. Curiously, we've got Northwest, a region we'd um, expect to be high as being the lowest, 62.4%. But this is for the ONS region split. This is just the northwest that is um, essentially Lancashire and Cheshire. If we do an NHS region split, this one becomes much higher and is the highest, uh, has the highest attack rate, which is quite curious. So rural Cumbria and the northeast, um, which include, is included in that region, uh, must have high attack rates. Um, estimates for the current, this is for the, from the hospitalization models. We've got the infection hospitalization ratio. So we're still getting, despite the vaccination program, 5.3% of infections in the other 75s and 065 overall will result in a hospitalization. Um, and we have various uh, plots to make sure the, the model's tracking the data pretty well. Um, as this is an Isaac Newton Institute and East of England is first one in the alphabet, I'll, I'll feature the East of England and, and England. Um, so the fit overall to the country, which we don't model the country as a single entity, we, this is the sum over regions, and this is one of the individual component regions. We, we can match the ONS um, estimate of prevalence pretty well, although it's slightly less good by age. Um, this is the infection incidence over time. Uh, cumulative infections, which interestingly, since about December um, 2021, the emergence of Omicron, we've had about 40 to 45 percent of the total infection seen so far in just, just a few short months. Um, the fit to the emissions that we get to the NHS sit rep is, is also pretty good, although we do struggle around some of the peaks. And we get these estimates for the IHR over time. Although I put it here for the under fours, we, across all age groups, we get a falling um, IFR over time, but there is a slight increase currently. A slight upward trend in the overall, but that reflects an increasing age, a shift at uh, increasing age groups in the in the infection mix. Um, and this is plots of R over time. You can see for these millions here has been particularly volatile. Um, we probably could have greater smoothing there. Again, I'll, I'll come to that a bit later on. And this this, this spaghetti plot has now become a scribble for the for the probability of R being great currently being greater than one. Uh, which is high almost everywhere with the exception of Yorkshire and Humber currently. Um, this has had some uses outside of um, real-time modelling by setting vaccine efficacy parameters to zero and using everything at our four posteriors for everything else. We can generate scenarios for what would happen in the absence of an effective uh, vaccine. Um, and overall, we reckon that we, well, we estimated, this is early October, there were 20 million infections prevented, 105,000 deaths. 
we're obviously at some point in in uh, sort of early September. This was much higher until the, the red line, which was what actually happened. Um, what we think would have happened, our counterfactual, and the blue line is, is what actually happened when they actually crossed, where we exhausted the susceptibles. And obviously, this is an unrealistic scenario because you would like to think the government would intervene if we were if 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 we were at this stage. But currently, we've got three hundred thousand infections per day, and, and they're not. So, uh, but Delta was a more severe a more severe wave. Uh, so looking at transmission dynamics a bit more in a bit more detail, uh, we approximate an ODE system through a system of differential equations. So we have a force of affection, which um, providing people are vaccinated in a time interval. Um, we have a number of people. That are, this is our susceptible population. Um, and they're exposed to a um, particular force of infection um, uh, with, with some reduced um, susceptibility due to, due to vaccination. This force of infection hinges on this Q quantity here, which is a, 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 a probability of infection parameter. Um, and, and then the pi gives the vaccine efficacy at, at time TK. This transmission probability, the crucial thing to take away here is that it depends on, on, on the transmission potential, which we model as a random walk over time. So discretized diffusion process. Um, these contact matrices or matrix components are derived weekly from the contact matrices that I just described earlier, but also with the addition of some age and region specific susceptibility parameters. So we modify how likely it is for different age groups to get infected. And this R0 star is a normalizing contact, contact constant, giving the time zero dominant eigenvalue of the next generation matrix. Um, this, is a, this is how we calculate R0. So the fully susceptible R, the R, the actual effective reproductive number comes from this formula here. Again, the diffusion process in there um, multiplied by what we think R is to begin with, and then the, the waning through the decline in the dominant eigenvalues of generation next generation matrices. I apologize, this is all very index heavy, um, so no one can spot mistakes as I go through. Um, uh, and then we have an all England reproduction number, which is um, the region specific reproduction numbers averaged across the number of uh, infections currently occurring. Um, so just looking at how um, these two quantities, the beta and the R star relate to each other. So the R star is, um, well, what I'm gonna plot next slide isn't technically R star, but it's the dominant eigenvalue of the, the contact matrices before we alter them with parameters. And looking at throughout 2020, plotting the betas that we estimated and, and R and the R stars, what we're getting from Edwin's contact matrices to see if the contact matrices adequately described um, or anticipated the changes in transmission we're going to see. So ideally these would all be, um, uh, for regardless of the, the, the eigenvalue of the, of the contact matrix, the, the beta value would, would, would be unchanging if it was doing well. But actually what we found is that they were, um, the early part of the pandemic, which is in dark blue, there was a, a negative correlation between the two. So the, uh, the betas were, were providing some kind of compensatory effect to the, to the contact matrices. So the, the contact matrices were overplaying um, the, the role of, uh, of mobility and movement. And this, was in a, this was in a phase of epidemic decline. And then when the epidemic was accelerating again and later in the year, after the school closure, they, the beta values were augmenting um, the contact matrices. So the, the greater the rate of contact, the greater the beta. So this was a period of growth. So I don't know if this is an epidemic phase shift issue or if it's just uh, uh, something to do with the fact that contact matrices overplayed what, what was actually happening um, to, be, to be determined. But rolling this out for the whole pandemic, um, we can look at the, the plot. These are, these are plots of beta over time in the colored bar segments by region. This really highlights how different London is at various times. So we're running into the end of 2020, um, beta values were clearly distinct from, from all the other regions. And again, in late 2021, when the emergence of Omicron, similar thing was happening. So much faster, much earlier rate of transmission occurring in London. Um, other thing to pick up on here is that um, there's not a huge increase in the betas over time as we as Omicron emerges. This is because we 
um, had higher rates of had an increase induced in our model a high rate of waning here. But without that rate of waning, we see that the uh, model without a, a, an increased rate of waning around the measures of BA two uh, in sort of late in mid, mid mid to late February, uh, only the betas in the model can account for that. So we have ra very rapid increase in the beta values there. Well, Sorry, if we have to have a little bit of a discussion, maybe you only have a couple of minutes at this okay. point. Okay, yeah, okay. I'm really through. <laughs> um, okay, and the, and the black line again plot, plots the dominant angular values of the, of the contact matrices. Um, just quick go through the computational challenges. Um, as you see, model complexity has grown throughout the pandemic. Um, we're currently fitting over 600 parameters. Um, so it's Bespoke, parallelized, optimized C plus plus codes, um, and still model ones take close to twenty four hours um, using a, a MCMC algorithm called or well, a customized version of Adaptive Metropolis within global scaling algorithm. Uh, ongoing work is uh, scalable parameterizations of um, of the beta to make it more efficient without exploding the parameter space too much. Uh, and Samitra will be presenting that at the AI stat, AI stats conference at the end of the month. And we're also developing algorithms to detect multiple posterior modes. We're not always guaranteed that our um, different chain, different MCMT chains will, will, will end up in the same place or converge to the same place. So we have to run multiple chains and look to see which one's the best. Um, you're all probably familiar with the uses of the model. Um, this is going towards the R, the SPIM consensus for R. Um, R2 models based on deaths and the emissions that are the light and dark blue there. So I've chosen a time where they're fairly uncontroversial. Um, and also doing the medium term projections for here for emissions and what we think is going to happen over the next four to six weeks or so. Um, this is also just to show that our results have been disseminated via regular reports within the UKHSA, but also um, to places like the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, who are using them to inform elective surgery for children based on our estimates for prevalence. Um, and I've done a few bullet points for future and ongoing work, but there's this. I mean, I think there's probably enough work to take us onto the next pandemic. Um, better treatment of waning and probably estimating weights of waning is one that I'd particularly like to, to look at. Um, to sort of just, just to be able to extract the effect uh, the effects of relaxing uh, measures, pandemic measures and, and the effect that has on the betas with, with the waning of immunity, which is a bit convoluted at the moment. Um, coming second boost of vaccinations. How will the transition to endemicity look like? What data will be available in the future? And how will we start um, modeling? We'll have to start modeling the using the model in, 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 in over successive windows rather than modeling it from day one. Um, response to any future variants and waves, which we hope there aren't, and constantly addressing the many, many computational challenges. Um, and then just acknowledging of the, the, the team that has grown over the course of the pandemic initially, it was Danny, Josh, and I, with some advice from Nick and Andre, but we've we've gathered extra people as we've gone along. Um, Samitra and Angelos provide the the Bayesian MCMC expertise, uh, and Joel and Josh have particularly been very good at making our results look very presentable. Um, thank you. I'll finish there. Thank you very much. Um, maybe there is there is time just for a couple of questions if we are lucky mm -hmm. enough. Uh, so who? Who wants to ask any question, please? Oh, um, okay. Uh, from from Pietro. Pietro, please ask directly. He wants to know basically how you integrate uh, Google Mobility data in your model calibration pipeline. Um. I, can I throw that one over to the, the expert in this, which is Edwin Van Nelden, <laughs> who, who I saw on meeting. <laughs> well, uh, Edwin is there, so if he wants to, to, to come in, please. Edwin? Yeah, so um, the, the contact matrices, so there's a, um, there's a publication on it, but what, what it ends up doing, so we take the polymods data, uh, which is subdivided in various locations, uh, like um, uh, leisure, school, etc. Uh, and we, using time use data, we actually uh, make it even more fine grained. So we look at um, uh, context at or leisure is split up further into visits and home home 
contexts are split into visits uh, and contacts with ho household members. And then the Google Mobility data is kind of used to scale these various activities. So, um, for example, we assume kind of that uh, social visits are skilled with retail and recreation data there. Um, work, of course, with workplace data and there's trans transit data. So we skill that with uh, uh, mobility um, rates for transit uh, in Google. Uh, so that, yeah, that is basically how that works, if that makes sense. And we do that on a weekly ba basic, so basis. So we kind of the Google mobility data, we kind of um, uh, take the weekly, that are daily rates, but we kind of uh, make them into weekly rates or take the mean over the week. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Otherwise, we can <laughs> we can continue in the chat. There is yeah. another question which we might just about to be able to uh, address. Um, so, can I ask Paul if Paul's model is applicable to predicting case positivity rate in other countries? Um, Predict case positivity rate. Yeah. So we can we can. Um, so as I said, this, what we have here is a, is a is a framework. So what we have coded up is a, is a framework for the pandemic modeling. So we can incorporate a number of different time series of, of data if we think it's proportional, subject to some reporting delays and and um, observation errors to to the to the pattern of infection. So if 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 there is a a reliable stream of data, a time series of data on on positivity. We, I don't see why we could not do it. Um, there's various different things that you probably wouldn't be able to identify, so you'd have to limit the number of parameters you estimate. For example, we use the serology data, uh, and, and now uh, to a degree the prevalence data, now we're so far through the pandemic to give some idea of scale of infection. The data such as case, um, case positivity and hospitalizations and deaths are, are, are great for modeling the pattern of infection over time, but um, if you're considering the overall scale of the pandemic, you need some additional data. But if you've got good estimates for what that might be, if you know what your case ascertainment rate might be, then then yes, then that is something that could be done easily. Uh, we were we were using this at the beginning uh, for Scotland, for instance, so we or yeah. for Italy, for some parts of Italy. So in principle, yes, I think is is uh, as Paul said, is the is the data that are questionable. Uh, whether they are, they are valuable, whether they're interpretable. Um, anything else? Any other questions? No. Okay, thank you very much to Paul and to Ron Joy for the interesting talks, very different and there is a